Once again, to the Catholic Club podcast. Today, we're going to be taking a reading and a look at a writing from Saint Leo the Great in one of his letters. It's a very beautiful Advent reflection. And today's podcast will be on the shorter end of the podcast. Um, so, reference usually these take around 20, 15, 30 minutes and instead of the two hours that the long form discussions sometimes take. Or one hour, as the Aquinas series has proven that it can take. So, uh, just giving you a heads up. That way, if you prefer to listen to a specific podcast, or you like the, excuse me, a specific uh, style of what I've been doing so far in my podcast, there you go. You have it. You know whether we, whether you would like to listen to this. And without further ado, let's get into that really good Advent reflection that St. Lou has for us today. To speak of our Lord... The Son of the Blessed Virgin Mary, as true and perfect man, is of no value to us if we do not believe that he is the descendant from the line of ancestors set out in the Gospel. Matthew's Gospel begins by setting out the genealogy of Jesus, son of David, son of Abraham, and then traces his human descendants by bringing his ancestral line down to his mother's husband, Joseph. On the other hand, Luke traces his parentage back, step by step, to the actual father of mankind, to show that both the first and the last Adam share the same nature. No doubt, the Son of God in his omnipotence could have taught and sanctified men by appearing to them in a semblance of human form as he did to the patriarchs and prophets. But, for instance, he engaged when, for instance, he engaged in a wrestling contest or entered into conversation with them, or when he accepted their hospitality and even ate the food they set before him. But these appearances were only types, signs, that that mysteriously foretold the coming of the one who would take a true human nature from the stock of the patriarchs who had gone before him. No more figure, then, fulfilled the mystery of our reconciliation with God, ordained from all eternity. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon the Virgin, nor had the power of the Most High overshadowed her, so that within her spotless womb, wisdom might build itself a house, and the Word become flesh. The divine nature and nature of a servant were to be united in the one person so that the creator of time might be born in time, and he through whom all things were made might be brought forth in their midst. For unless the new man, by being made in the likeness of sinful humanity, had taken on himself the nature of our first parents, unless he had stooped to be one in the su- in substance with his mother while sharing the father's substance, and being alone free from sin, united to our nature, united our nature to his, the whole human race would still be held captive under the dominion of Satan. The conqueror's victory would have profited us nothing if the battle had not had been fought outside our human condition. But through this, wist, <laughs> through this wonderful blending, the mystery of the new birth shone upon us, so that through the same Spirit by whom Christ was conceived and brought forth, we too might be born again in a spiritual birth. And in consequence, the evangelist declares, the faithful to have been born not of blood, nor of the desire of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That is the ending of a reading from St. Leo the Great. 
Man, there are so many beautiful elements in here. One of the ones that is just so pertinent is that he shows that um, yeah, Jesus had the same nature as Adam. And that the constant theme in this work is that God, it is very fitting that he came and became a part of our nature so that we would most profit from it. So, uh, yeah, Thomas Aquinas says, you know, why was it necessary that God became man uh, and became incarnate in the flesh? And he says, well, you know, in a sense, it was, there's there's two different types of necessity. There's like necess- necessities that you absolutely have to have and necessities that make things so, um, I wouldn't say ex- accessible, but I would say so practical that they become a necessity. So, for instance, the holiday seasons are coming up. We all want to see family. I don't live close to my family currently. I know probably some of you are the same. In order to travel back home, you probably are going to take a car or a plane. Um, and it's necessary because within the lives that we live and the time frames that we have, uh, just walking on foot would be completely impractical. By the time we got to our houses, if we were lucky, we would already have expended most of our time that we have off from work and would have to come back um, and have no time with our family. So we see these inventions that we've made, cars and planes, as necessary because they make it so expedient that it becomes it becomes not something that is just like, okay, it made our journey easier, though it did, and made our journey quicker, which it did, but it made our journey possible and practical. So you have, like, the first necessity of just, like, okay, you know, things that you have to have, like water, oxygen, food for life, and then there's that second necessity of which it is just so... It, it, it's so convenient... And it helps us along our our journey so much that it becomes necessary because of that reason. So for Thomas Aquinas and this, he would say that God became man and it was necessary not because of the first reason, because like, you know, he had to happen this way, but because of the second reason of necessity or the second definition, I should say, of necessity, because it was so fitting that God should become man. Not because like we earned it, we did the exact opposite, but because God is love and he shows us this love when the glory of the heavens, the glory, the word of God that created the angels, the word of God that created all of space, that created us, that created everything that ever existed and is existing and will exist, put aside the glory of his majesty as God in that creative word and entered into the very finite nature of our humanity, that he he chose to humble himself, as scripture says, taking the form of man, and did not deem equality with God. Like, it shows us so much about who God is, which is incredibly important. So much of the world tells us what God is. So much of life, so much of Satan tells us of what God is. So much of our own thoughts will tell us what God is, but only God truly knows what he is, obviously. But two, he he shows us through scripture of who he is, and he shows us through salvation history, and he shows us through church of who he is. And if he is a God of love, and love is caring for the other for the sake of the other, and it's selfless, then of course Jesus Christ, the word of God, the glory of God, would come down Set aside what is great and what is magnificent to save us because he loves us. And how fitting is it that when he became man, he didn't distance himself from the association of fallen man, but he entered through the line of Adam. He entered through the line of all of those who constantly failed before him. Like Abraham failed in the covenant. David failed in his covenant. All the covenants that man created, that God invited man into, they failed. But Jesus doesn't distance himself from our failures, but he comes right into the midst of it, and he sanctifies it, and he he renews it into the everlasting covenant that we have now with him. 
So that second point that I have, that's the first point, like God loves us and he shows us that love by becoming incarnate. But the second point is that God does not distance himself because we fail. In fact, he does the exact opposite. He wants us to invite him into those failures so that he can redeem it. As, you know, Pope Leo said here in in this one, so that um, to show that both the first and the last Adam share the same nature, showing that, you know, Jesus came to undo what Adam did. And he wasn't distancing himself from Adam, but in fact the opposite. He came and became so personally united to Adam's line that he became a part of Adam's line so that he could redeem it. And how pertinent is that to us in the midst of a season where we're trying to prepare for the coming of God? And, you know, one of those things that might be in the way is, you know, our sins. But one of the additive things that might be really hurting us is that we're holding on to our sin and we're looking at that as yeah we separated ourselves from god but god is not separating himself from us he's wanting to get closer to us so if if you're in in venial sin and you have venial sins and you know that you can do better you wish you can do better god is not far from you he's wanting you to divide him into those things so that he can heal him and he can heal you if you're in mortal sin and you're in anguish because of this, and you want to have this union with God, that anguish that you have is an invitation from God to receive reconciliation so that he can once again be close to you. He wants you to accept his healing that he's provided to us in the church, to forgive sins, so that when you hear those words, I forgive you of your sins, you know 100% it, it is absolutely true because it is instituted by Christ and it has the authority of Christ which he has given to his church. So that's my second point today. It's like, okay, when when you are in the midst of sin and when it is happening, do not focus on how terrible you are, but focus on the God who wants to come in the middle of that and redeem you. I mean, just think of St. Mary Magdalene. How God came into the midst of that. And how when she was in the very act of people accusing her and about to stone her and kill her, he comes to the midst and he writes in the sand and the crowd slowly goes away. And when the crowd's gone, what does he say? He doesn't say, I accuse you. He says, where are those who accuse you? And she says, they're all gone. And he says, well, neither do I accuse you. That's our God. Invite him into the midst of those moments where you are sinning because He wants to heal you because he is a God of love. And the other part that I thought was just so beautiful was just, ah, the beautiful, just ah, tapestry that God creates. Like it's a full story. It's a complete story. So in the beginning, you have Adam and you have Eve and Eve picks of the fruit and Adam does nothing and is silent. And that doesn't mean that he has any less sin, right? Because uh, in in the church, and we're confessing our sins together, we say, uh, "Forgive me for all the things that I have done and what I have failed to do." So we see that there are two there are two sins, and they're just equally sinful. That the things that we do and the things we fail to do are the things that are both equally sinful. There's not one less, which is important because when you talk about Adam, like you you see Adam right next to Eve. Uh, if you go to the old the Hebrew and it actually Satan's talking to both of them. So you have what I have done, Eve picking from the tree of life and outreaching and taking for her own. And you have Adam who's right next to her who does nothing. So you have the two sins, what I have done and what I have failed to do. And then you see Adam redeeming, I'm sorry, Adam is being redeemed and Jesus is coming into his line and redeeming him. And he is, doing all the things that we've ever failed. So for example, the Israelites when they're in their exodus, they have many sins. They complain to God. And in fact, God inflicts serpents at one time upon them. And it's because they are hungry. Well, in, in the desert, after Jesus receives baptism, the baptism from John, he goes into the desert. And what is one of the first temptations? It says that he fasted for 40 days and he was hungry, as, as I would be too. But he doesn't give in to that hunger. So he's undoing what Israel did in the desert because God is coming and he's redeeming all of salvation history. 
Okay, well, what about Eve? So you have Eve who goes to the tree of life and takes from it. And then in her disobedience, the human race, along with Adam, is lost to sin. And then you have you know, Jesus coming and redeeming Adam's side, but he also creates Mary. What does Mary do? She is obedient. And instead of reaching out, she receives the fruit of the tree of life. So that in one instance, <laughs> Eve reaches out to the fruit in disobedience and takes for herself. Mary sets aside all her plans in life and lets God do this really inconvenient thing of giving her a child because like at this point in time, like Mary and Joseph weren't living, they were betrothed. Joseph was away building a house for them, so he's not there in the picture. So God giving her a baby at this point in time is extremely problematic because Joseph's not there. So how did she get a baby? And, you know, it's not every day that the Holy Spirit comes down and conceives a child. In fact, I only know of one time it happened. So imagine, like, the inconvenience of everyone around her in that small town of Nazareth knowing that she got pregnant when Joseph was away. And she, like, that's definitely going to come to the forefront of her mind as this angel is talking to her and saying, hey, like, you will, like, you can conceive a child and the Holy Spirit wishes to do something upon you and wishes to fulfill what the prophet Isaiah spoke of. Or, excuse me, that's not Isaiah. I believe it's, um, uh, maybe Samuel on Nathan, excuse me, where he goes to King Ahaz and he says, I will give you a sign as deep as, uh, as you wish. I'm paraphrasing here. He says, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child. Uh, so, excuse me, sorry, I misquoted my, my prophets there. Um, yeah, so, actually it might have been Isaiah, I might have been wrong. Um, anyways, besides the point, it's scripture, you can find it. Uh, going back to what I was saying, though, like, there was there was a sacrifice that Mary was making when she said yes. It wasn't just like, hey, there's a baby, this is great. It's, hey, this is going to be extremely inconvenient this is going to burden my life and there's this this is going to bring turmoil in my life but she said yes and she received it despite the struggles that were going to come so we see that jesus is undoing adam's sin and jesus creates mary and through mary's obedience she receives the holy spirit and conceives jesus so you see the complete and total picture here being fulfilled in in this and it's just it's beautiful. It's a very beautiful reflection. It's a very good reflection. So I hope um I hope you've enjoyed today's podcast. I hope it's brought you I don't know, some inspiration. And yeah, I hope you guys are doing good during this crazy advent season where we um yeah, we're all trying to make our way through this crazy world and God bless you guys. I hope you have a wonderful advent season, getting close to Christmas, and I'll pray for you if you pray for me. And by the way, I looked it up. It was Isaiah. I was right. <laughs>